some uh, informal conversation with the students. We look forward to that conversation. But let me uh, again introduce Joel, uh, who is a research fellow at the University of Southern California Center on Public Diplomacy, and also a lecturer um, for the School of Global Policy and Strategy at, at UC San Diego. Um, De uh, Joel is also a candidate currently for San Diego City Council, um, and so hopefully we'll get to chat a little bit about that too. But Joel today is going to talk about um, his research on how um, global non-state actors like cities uh, shape global governance. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Joel. Um, you, Joel, you're going to talk for about 30 minutes or so. We are then going to have a more informal Q&A here. We've got about um, eight to 10 people on Zoom as well. So Joel, you and I need to be at the microphone for, uh, for our Zoom audience, um, but we we will be uh, very uh, excited to take questions from, from all of you here as well, and we'll pass the microphone around as necessary. So thanks again. Welcome, Joel. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Great. It's such a pleasure to be back home at the <laughs> University of Denver in the Corbell School. Thanks for the warm welcome. Um, so today, yeah, we're talking about city diplomacy as a concept and a much larger international political economy shift. Um, in the nature of power being urbanized in the 21st century. Um, so today I, um, I'm wearing a couple of different hats, not my campaign hat for the first time in like 13 months. Um, I, I love teaching because I get to take off that campaign hat at UCSD and just kind of delve into topics like this. Um, and, but I'm always welcome uh, questions about the, uh, the practice of politics at the city level. But today, we're going to really uh, delve into uh, both the pitfalls and promises of city diplomacy in the 21st century. Um, this builds on an article uh, that I can send out uh, later uh, that was just published by uh, the uh, USC's Center for Public Diplomacy um, on many of these themes that we're talking about here today. So by way of introduction to the topic, my clicker's not working, Georgiana. It's okay. I think nothing is working, actually. There we go. Okay. Okay, by way of introduction, uh, just setting the groundwork for why cities are important public policy units of analysis in an IR school, right? Thinking about cities, Glazer in 2012, um, in a book ostensibly about um, climate change in urban environments, says cities are not making us just richer and smarter and greener and healthier and happier but they're fulfilling actual security obligations like dealing with climate adaptation and resiliency. Oftentimes, like in that topic, the nation state are um, very much neglecting the sorts of security investments that we need in order to survive as a species, but cities are the ones doing that, that massive public policy investment. Michael Bloomberg, in his ill-fated run uh, for president, um, uh, pinned this op-ed in the New York Times uh, that was entitled, It is the City Century, where he made the claim that the failure of the lurch towards autocracy, the failure of, of uh, nationalism, is really what he was um, indicting in his campaign, and that mayors posed a unique perspective in national discourse, and that cities are really leading in this century. Benjamin Barber uh, wrote a book in 2017 that mayors should rule the world and made a case for why local action matters for global policy, and that's kind of what we're unpacking here today. In the early days of the Trump administration, you may remember that, of course, he pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accords. And in that um, action, mayors from all around the world stood up to say, well, in the absence of national leadership, we are going to pledge ourselves to this work. That started with, uh, he was the chair at the time of the C40, um, over 40 different cities working on climate action. So the mayor of Los Angeles tweeted this, if Donald Trump won't lead on climate, American cities will join climate mayors to uphold the Paris Agreement. And that 
cascaded throughout the United States where Republicans and Democrats in cities like San Diego and Kansas City and over 70 mayors in the 70 largest cities around the country all pledged to instill the Paris Climate Accords within their own public policy and their own law. Uh, even uh, little city council candidates uh, were talking about the importance of cities uh, at that time. But cities are not only working on these big public policy challenges uh, at the global level, but cities are increasingly full of capacity and will be so um, for the foreseeable future. And so thinking about the evolution of governance or what were we just talking about this program on the future of governance, navigating the future of governance, we're gonna have to navigate the precipitous increase in global population rooted in cities. By mid-century, 66% of the world is gonna be based in a major metropolitan or urban area. Um, and so with the global population rapidly moving into urban environments, power and our concepts of material, normative, productive power are inexorably tied to the urban environment. And that leads us to a broader urban turn in international relations. And urban turn uh, matters for the study of international politics in a number of ways. Primarily, we could think about cities as being new sorts of agents or units of analysis in the study of international politics. They are neat because they're discrete, easily observable, easily measurable, um, and can be geocoded and all of these other uh, things that allow for both qualitative and quantitative studies of this unit of analysis. Cities are sites of the global challenges that we face in this generation and generations to come, thinking about terrorist response, pandemic response, economic inequality and homelessness, the strains of Human insecurity, food insecurity, climate insecurity are rooted within these urban environments in unique ways. And the challenges that we face go through the capacity and ability of cities to actually be the forefront of these, um, of these responses. Thinking about the pandemic response, for example, a not very well organized national response from the United States burdened mayors and city councils all across the United States with playing public health official or playing CDC in the absence of national leadership. You can actually see that taking place in climate, in pandemic response, in emergency responses like to wildfires. And if you think about all kind of seven different buckets of human security, water, food, et cetera, those run through the ability of cities to build their built environment in a way that is sensitive to those everyday security needs. The thing that I'm going to repeatedly come back to in today's talk is the work of Saskia Sasson, who argues that cities are actually globalization in real life. Globalization isn't this ideological concept that is happening kind of at the global level that is not something we can touch. We touch it every day. We are working within the confines of globalization today as we're live streaming this across the world, right? Um, as the technology of the pandemic has shown, um, the fiber optic cables underneath our paved streets, the airport that I flew into yesterday, and on and on are material locations of globalization rooted in place. And that is a, a central, central idea in this urban turn of IR. City diplomacy arises within this larger capacity conversation and these networks are seeing a huge rise around the world. City to city level diplomacy where mayors and city council members and city managers are working together. Sorry, I didn't press my timer here. Are working together in order to grapple with these human security challenges. Um, you see the rise of 
groups like C40 to work on climate, Mayors for Peace to work on uh, nuclear uh, proliferation issues, 100 resilient cities, again, working on climate resiliency, the Strong Cities Network, which I've worked with the most out of all these networks. I was the city of San Diego's representative to the Strong City Network, working on extremism, hate crimes, and, and um, terrorist violence. Uh, and the list goes on. There's more than 200 city to city level networks working on every issue on, on the globe. In kind of classic liberal IR, we might call this regime building. As we think about bundles of norms and expectations and practices and even rules, it's cities that are coming together to build 21st century regimes in a way that we may think about uh, kind of regime theory coming from the 1970s and 1980s and uh, kind of liberal IR. This allows us an opportunity to think through a hybridization of governance where there's multiple stratifications of ways that we engage a topic like climate resiliency, where there may be an agreement at the transnational level and implementation at the neighborhood level. We might think about how diplomatic entrepreneurialism is really expanding. Um, and we'll talk about that at the end of this talk, how there's multiple avenues of diplomacy, not just through the State Department, but through individual advocacy at the local level that can actually, from the local, transcend to the transnational. Um, there's, there's other ways to think about this in terms of epistemic communities, say all of the different city managers get together to talk about how they're dealing with stormwater infrastructure, right? Learning together, thinking about best practices, translating their best practices around the world and importing best practices from other cities. That is an epistemic community creating norms in process. And so really what we're seeing is that these are micro geographies that are advocating they're pulling together regimes and perhaps producing transnational outcomes in a way that is extraordinarily powerful, observable, and that makes cities, I would argue, probably the most powerful non-state actor um, ar around the world right now. Um, final thoughts on the urban turn in IR and why it's very exciting is that at the same time we are both deterritorializing power in the concept of looking away from the nation state and away from sovereignty, and looking at very specific spatial locations about where an idea may generate and then transpire at the transnational level. It allows us an opportunity to disaggregate power. Um, what Jane Jacobs, very famous urbanist in the 1970s, she wrote The Life and Death of the American City. Well, her observation, for urban studies was, well, things like GDP and productivity are not very helpful ways of thinking about economic growth. You got to disaggregate and see about where that's happening. It's happening at the neighborhood level. It's happening at the city level and that cities are economic drivers. My argument here is that we need to do that in IR. We have the capability of doing that in IR, thinking about power in that same sort of disaggregated way that's very spatialized and local. And so, with that all as introduction to this place within the discipline and this place in larger geopolitical foundations, I want to do just three things. Um, I want to talk just briefly about uh, theory building um, because there hasn't been a lot of theory linkages between, say, security studies, international relations, uh, urbanism, and I want to kind of wed international sociology, wed all of those together in um, the context of what cities, how cities are gaining their capacity. Then I'm going to uh, talk about five puzzles on a pragmatic level. What are cities supposed to do, like Denver? Based upon the theory that we're talking about, what are cities supposed to do in order to do city diplomacy, to engage around the world, what are best practices for them to think through? And in answering those puzzles, it's very clear that we need a lot more data. And so I'll end the talk today in a scholarly conversation around the data that we need as social scientists to think through this as its own sort of sub-discipline 
and perhaps um, craft a future of comparative municipalism as a, as a field. Each one of these areas is extraordinarily critical to advancing, I would argue, the welfare of residents um, within each one of these cities, um, to advance their capacity to speak to growing global challenges, but not only about the welfare of residents, but city diplomacy, and this is kind of the, the red flag that I wanna throw up. If we do not think through um, why cities are gaining capacity, why they're gaining power, and how they should exercise their power to benefit their residents. If we don't think through that, then right now poses a really critical and perhaps problematic time for those doing city diplomacy. And that if we do it wrong, we will entrench as practitioners, we will entrench the economic polarization that we're finding on our cities. We could entrench the homelessness pandemic um, or epidemic that we're having in our cities. And we can miss the shift and the opportunity that we have in order to really address uh, basic human needs. So by way of starting and talking about the theory that we need, um, you know, most city diplomacy starts with the concept that we should have these kind of cultural ties between similar cities uh, as ourselves. Um, and I think that that is exactly um, the wrong place to start. And I'll explain why in a moment. The State Department this year um, has started a new program where they are embedding foreign service officers as one of their opportunities to go on tour, a two-year tour, to be rooted within a city and to be assigned to a mayor in order to grow a city's global footprint and uh, global impact. It's a great opportunity. My question is, what is it that we're asking them to do? There is a, a uh, former ambassador who is the deputy mayor of city diplomacy in the city of Los Angeles. Um, I had a similar role at the city of San Diego and on and on throughout global cities around the world. What is it that we are asking them to do and for whom? That's the baseline that we need to answer here. It's not just clever sister city arrangements anymore. The power that is located in cities means we have a great responsibility to quote Spider-Man, which I watch a lot with my three-year-old. So here's where we need to start to answer that question. What is it that we want our city diplomats to be doing? Well, it starts with this Saskia assassin concept. Uh, she, she writes in 2005, the global city introducing a concept that cities are the physical terrain where seemingly immaterial globalization processes manifest in local concrete forms. That trade is located here, that FDI is deeply located within cities, and that when we talk about uh, the speed of communication or travel or capital servicing, um, that what we're actually talking about is the capacity of a local city. And it looks a couple of different ways, according to Sasson. First of all, you see that there is a massive dispersion in global cities, not just American, but around the world, a dispersion of physical production that like hollows out cities, right? Thinking about Detroit and the, how the automobile industry has fled. Um, this is a phenomenon that is occurring and has occurred in our lifetimes in cities the world around. And that dispersion of physical production to the global periphery means that cities have become less about goods that are produced and more about an agglomeration of capital. And that cities, especially in the late 1990s and into the early 2000s, become an agglomeration of what we mean when we refer to globalization. There's massive mobile labor capacities. There is massive investments into capital access. There's transaction binding, which means lots of different industries bind around main industries that are located. The Fortune 500 companies that are located in a city all of the managers and lawyers and CPAs and accountants band and bond against uh, uh, with those companies. And so you see the massive investment into capital mobility and that cities, Sasson would argue, become vehicles for global capital rather than for places where people live. And that the agglomeration economy is a new feature of global politics rooted in cities. 
And that, of course, an agglomeration effect attracts a certain, with magnetism, a certain type of class, a certain type of people. Um, Richard Florida would call it the creative class, where you have an investment into the sorts of things that very educated people like to spend their money on, uh, like recreation and entertainment and responsive government and luxury and boutique culture. Um, the idea that there's a yoga studio and a craft coffee shop that are reproduced in every city and they look all the same around the world, right? That sort of cultural reproduction is happening in cities the world round. And that's really what we're talking about when we refer to the definition of global cities. Dispersion, agglomeration, and attraction effects are the, the nature and sort of the productive power happening within these cities. The problem with this, of course, is that it has resulted in massive economic polarization. As the poor in, and working class have been marginalized and pushed out of the center core of cities and replaced by capital. We have wealth polarization that has resulted in slums on the outskirts and the center of cities becoming places of vertical gated communities. The slumification of the world as noted by Mike Davis, the gentrification of American cities as noted by P.E. Moskowitz in their recent book. Florida now calls it the middle class donut. Uh, where the middle class has become hollowed out of urban environments. And this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's happening in places like Berlin um, and, and other global cities. And it leads us to the question of all of this growth, all this amazing new capacity coming into our cities. Who is it for? And who is our city fundamentally for? Because out of that grows the question, what is our city diplomacy for? Why are we doing global engagement in the first place? Is it to double down on this process? And my, my red flag that I wanna throw up for the discipline is if we don't think critically about what is happening in terms of dispersion of people and the polarization of wealth, then the diplomacy of cities simply becomes a tool of competition to bring in more capital and push out more people. And that results in that sort of push of gentrification, that as new hipster coffee shops and developments and all that come into the heart of our cities, pushing people out once they become gentrified. I would say that there is, these are my terms, um, but I, you're free to use them. Um, my one of the ways that I would categorize the way that we do city global engagement is just to further that process that I was talking about. So there is a competitive school of thought that that follows this logic. And the competitive school of thought says that we need to do global engagement in order to get our city out there around the world. We need to market our city as a product within a global market of place, right? That our city is to be consumed by largely global capital or companies or Fortune 500s. We want to attract that tax base here. And that if we don't do that work of attracting it, they're going to go to Tokyo, they're going to go to Austin and Denver or San Diego or wherever this, this city is, it's going to lose out if we're not actively putting ourselves out there. And so in this mindset, city diplomacy becomes about marketing. Uh, my favorite, of, uh, I, I show this to my students all the time, uh, make a note and Google it. Uh, there's a great ad campaign that Sadiq Khan put out after uh, the Brexit vote that said, well, yeah, we Brexited. However, London is open. London is open and affirming. London's a great place for um, all sorts of people from around the world. And it's a great place to invest your money. Your money is safe here. And it's all of these pictures of high finance in London. And it is about making sure that finance didn't flee London and go somewhere else in the mix, midst of Brexit. Um, it's the essence of what I mean by the competitive school of thought. If we don't invest in our own marketplace of place, they're going to, um, they're going to lose out. Um, and that results in things like the Amazon H2 headquarter uh, race to the bottom, where we find land or uh, tax incentives 
fueling a competition or a race to the bottom. And all of this comes back home locally. Everybody familiar with the Tabor law here in the state of Colorado, right? The whole argument about the taxpayer's bill of rights, or there's other versions in California that basically says, if we tax capital too much, they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else like to Texas. And therefore, we have to keep tax rates super low and actually cut the floor out of it so that we lure more businesses in. And so that is what we mean when we're talking about like the city growth machine, privileging capital over labor, over um, residents. So what does that mean for global engagement? What does that mean for a city diplomacy strategy? If your mayor comes along and says, we need to do city diplomacy, it will normally mean what we're doing in the status quo, what even the city of Denver is doing right now. The last international trip that your mayor went on, anybody know who sponsored that? It was sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce and it was sponsored by the airport and the airport led the international delegation. The airport staff led the delegation, right? And so it, it means that the goal of city diplomacy is about trade and economic impact and luring in new companies, signing memorandums of agreement with companies to relocate here and that it's led by private enterprise. It's usually led by uh, Chamber of Commerce affiliates. It's led by economic development corporations as is the case in San Diego and in uh, Los Angeles. And that our identity as cities becomes the furthering of this service to global capital, real estate investment trusts in order to relocate here and that sort of thing. If we are not critical about this, this deepens that middle-class donut, it deepens economic polarization, and then we are just units in international political economy deepening uh, crisis, I think, of capital. On the other side, there's a welfare school that I'll go through really quickly, and this is rooted in what we're seeing in places like Barcelona, the rise of the new municipalist movement, um, where they see social redistribution as the key function of city building. And that means that we need to focus on growing from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And there are lots of international networks of cities like cities for adequate housing that are talking about how are we serving our people, our residents, and what can we learn from other cities that are serving their residents in a similar way. Which means that the global engagement outcome from a welfare centric perspective is actually about global relationships being an instrument of resident need that we learn from one another to benefit our the welfare of our citizens and that that epistemic community of practice actually can result in mutual aid and cooperation and regimes that translate into better services for our residents rather than just cutting the floor out from the tax base to lure in new companies and so if that is what you want to do, one or the other, right? That's basically the choice that we have in front of us as policymakers. If that is what we need to do, then I, I say there's five puzzles that every city needs to think through. These five puzzles are like a why, what, when, where, how. When, what, where, why, what, when, where, how? What am I missing? Why do we need to engage? What? Why do we need to engage? are our cities these capital engines? And we need to have this serious conversation with elected officials and stakeholders. Are our cities here to compete for capital or to lead on a particular set of policies that serve our residents better? I would say that we need a guiding strategic plan, a raison d'etre for how our city engages around the world so that we're not furthering the deepening of an economic crisis. This is done really well, I would argue, by Barcelona, Spain. Um, in 2015 and 2016, at the height of uh, that first wave of um, Syrian, um, Syrian migration, um, Barcelona put together what they called the City of Refuge Framework. The City of Refuge Framework then worked with Lisbon and a number of other cities of similar mind where in fact they were operating very liberally or uh, as socialist mayors um, with other cities around Europe in the context of national conservative governments. So often transcending their state 
in order to implement migration sets of best practices and how to aid migrants coming in from Syria. Uh, they built that internal capacity using their relationships with other cities in Europe. And they, in fact, created a pipeline of resettlement that sidestepped their nation state. Um, they then built on that for COVID-19 response. And there is a city-to-city a -city network dealing with best practices in terms of dealing with the most vulnerable uh, of their residents in places like Lisbon and Barcelona and Madrid, all working together in the midst of economic recession and COVID-19. What do we want to work on with other cities is the primary question here. The second puzzle is who do we need to do city diplomacy? I would argue that instead of having it led by an EDC or Economic Development Corporation or Chamber of Commerce, um, what we need to really think through is is there a place for everyone in our city to participate in this global identity that we're trying to forge for our city? Should we democratize city diplomacy? And that allows space for not just bureaucrats or business owners, but all engaged parties like activists. I would ask, for example, what would a plan or a strategic framework for global engagement look like if it was, if it was crafted by policing justice advocates, right? What if a plank of a global engagement plan was led by criminal justice advocates or policing reform advocates? Because then that directs our city to engage Glasgow, for example, that did a complete overhaul. It was the most violent city in Europe. It's now one of the least violent cities in Europe with a public health approach to incarceration and to gang violence. Maybe it would result in that sort of twinning between our city and theirs. Maybe Paris's very poor um, engagement with stop and frisk would lead us to better practices. Maybe we would prioritize understanding how Tbilisi built, rebuilt their policing department from the ground up and learning best practices with them. Those sorts of engagements matter um, or are the outcome of who is making those decisions at the table. The what puzzle is in what ways can we judge success? I would say that we need key performance indicators built into even like our trash department or our streets department. Because if we silo global engagement in a city, we are doing injustice to a whole of city response. Um, we shouldn't just silo it in cultural affairs. And one city did that really, really well. Um, they actually built a requirement for every city decision that they make to go through a staff report to indicate to their decision makers, their mayor and their city council, what global best practices, what other cities were doing this and what, um, what we can learn from those cities. So that every mayor is thinking locally as they're making a very localized um, policy decision. One city did that really well um, and that is um, the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles has officially adopted this, the um, Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development uh, Goals and Initiatives into all of their key performance indicators for every city department. So imagine being like the trash department and being like, how do I build the UN uh, sustainable development goals into my report to city council, right? That is truly bringing the global local. The next question is, where is our focus? And I think that there are both internal and external audiences. This is the Los Angeles sustainable development goals, right? In adopting this, it's not just a performance indicator. It's speaking to our local residents about how we judge success about what we judge our, our, our success upon. We're also speaking to other cities around the world that have adopted SDIs or other governments around the world, maybe nation states, about how SDIs can be built into everything that we do. Los Angeles is speaking to both internal and external audiences through that mechanism. The final puzzle is kind of a win where can we accomplish this? And here I would quite simply say, as you build a strategic framework for global engagement, 
we need to think through, well, hey, we're dealing with a pandemic right now. Let's do international engagement around pandemic response or economic rebuilding after the pandemic. And that's exactly what Barcelona has done. They've pivoted from migration crises to um, deploying those same sites that were used to welcome immigrants, migrants from Syria. They've now begun using those same sites and that same logic to create community health clinics uh, responding to the COVID, um, COVID response. Um, so those challenges that we have, that welfare approach that we can pursue are address in sequences. Maybe homelessness is what we need to tackle for the next five years and then move on to sustainable development goals or whatnot. So that will allow us finally to prioritize partners and prioritize particular issue linkages between us and other cities or other governments. And that is how all of our cities need to be thinking through, are we just going through the motions and bringing capital in and all of the externalities that that brings? Or are we being thoughtful and employing a process of global engagement that is for our residents primarily? But then finally, in the last couple of minutes here, that brings us to a new research agenda. Unfortunately, because this is so, this has not been studied in a systematic way, we actually don't have data to answer questions like, why are cities going abroad? We have anecdotal evidence, but we don't have, have longitudinal data telling us why in aggregate our cities are engaging around the world. How are cities engaging in diplomacy? Who are they bringing with them on international trips? Um, are, they, are they just going with their economic development team? Are they bringing in other elements as well? Are cities actually achieving what they set out to achieve? There's no longitudinal data that even models dichotomous variables like success or failure. Those sorts of data sets, of course, exist for, um, Buena de, uh, de Mesquita has a data set on international diplomacy um, and its success rates. We have nothing analogous to that for cities. And so what I would say, if there's an entrepreneurial set of uh, scholars in here, unfortunately COVID and my campaign has interrupted my own data collection, uh, but there is a field out here that is rich in possibility. We can create longitudinal data that looks at when cities go abroad. We can look at, say, the last 20 years and the last the 20 big cities around the world, and we can actually look at how often they are doing international uh, diplomatic engagements. In that longitudinal data set, we can look at actors like mayors, or maybe it's a business owner or advocates that are going and who they are talking to. We need to look at their actions. Are they signing an agreement? Are they selling a particular product? Are they touring an education facility? What are they trying to learn and why are they engaged there? We need a longitudinal data set that talks about locations of visits, like going to an educational, uh, hi higher education uh, university, going to a business, going to a park, right? All of that data is out there qualitatively, uh, but it needs to be collected and turned into longitudinal data. And that's, that's kind of where we should end with success or failure as well, um, being a good dichotomous variable to understand. We can model all this uh, out and actually start answering questions. Uh, my preliminary uh, look at this, I looked at 10 large cities in the United States over 10 years. Uh, preliminary data basically shows that 90% of all city engagements are to lure businesses into their city, um, primarily sponsored by chambers. And I would say that if we don't stop right now and rethink the ways that we are engaging in diplomacy, we are just reifying global capital um, and all of those negative externalities that we are seeing that Saskia Assassin has predicted. And so by way of conclusion, I will just say, um, as IR scholars I, and, and perhaps international public policy thinkers, the urban turn in the discipline helps us understand the capacity of governments around the world in a disaggregated way. And I think that's a really productive turn in, um, in our discipline. And that we need to think through as both practitioners and scholars, whether the competition school of thought is producing what we want it to, or if we need to pivot to doing other things, putting other people in these diplomatic junkets, having a different vision for global engagement. 
And that I would say would be following the welfare approach, as I call it. There are practical puzzles that every mayor, every city council needs to mandate their staff work through um, so that we're not just going along with whatever, um, uh, you know, the State Department team that comes into our cities wants, wants us to do, uh, that we need to be thoughtful and engaged on it. Um, and those practical puzzles uh, should, be, um, should be directed by residents, I, I think is the ultimate conclusion here. And that the future of the discipline really requires a new step of rigor, a new step of data collection. Um, and I hope that all of you um, might be a part of that with me. I'll end by, by going back to Jane Jacobs and just saying uh, her basic takeaway and conclusion of her work is that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And that cities are the engines of economic power and that when we disaggregate power, it's cities and neighborhoods that give it that power, but then disaggregate further. Who is participating in that economic power? Who is the one, the shopkeepers who are keeping a particular neighborhood alive? This is an exciting place for international politics too, because then we can start saying international power, international authority, international norm making and regimes has the same trajectory. Like we can actually trace from the local shopkeepers and actions at the city council level on things like climate change or economic development or whatever the topic may be, homelessness, and trace that to a more democratic, engaged international politics, engaged international governance that has room for everybody to participate. And the city is the vehicle by which we can democratize global governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel, for a really wonderful talk. You want to join me over here in our informal uh, lounge? Um, it was remiss of me not to uh, announce at the, at, the, at the very beginning that um, the way that the Scrivener Institute of Public Policy and the C-Center for International Security and Diplomacy are co-sponsoring this talk uh, is through our uh, collaboration on the Navigating the Future of Governance uh, project, uh, which is not just a Corbell School initiative, it's also a DU-wide initiative being led out of and housed at the, at the C-Center. And I think what, what Joel has given us today is really a fantastic uh, you know, set of things to think about with regard to indeed the future of global governance through the lens uh, of, of the city. Joel, I found the talk really uh, inspiring, uh, both intellectually and pragmatically. So thank you so much um, for, for kind of setting us up for a wonderful conversation. I wanna remind folks on Zoom uh, that we are uh, open for questions. Uh, we're collecting your questions and they will be fed to me up here at the front of the room. So please do ask questions if you, if you have some. Um, I'll invite everybody in the room to also uh, please chime in and raise your hands. Uh, I'll keep a cue so that we can um, pepper Joel with all the questions I'm sure we have in the room. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the first question, Joel. Um, I especially liked and found really uh, interesting your uh, your kind of dichotomy, as you put it, between the competitive school uh, and the welfare school in terms of the sort of global uh, municipalism. I guess I would sort of posit that the reality is that cities do both, right? All cities do both. Um, and the question of the balance between uh, the competitive aspect and the welfare aspect is, is a really interesting one. It reminds me of the now fairly old scholarship on the varieties of capitalism in comparative political economy. So I wonder, you kind of used the phrase at the beginning, comparative municipalism. Um, what, are, what are the politics of this, right? So who are the actors that drive one or the other approach? And over time, what have we seen in terms of trends across major cities? Um, I would, my, again, my hypothesis would be that it kind of rises and falls with kind of global capitalism and, you know, cycles of financial crisis and so on. So I'm just curious to a little bit of historical perspective on who are the actors that are really kind of shaping where cities come down on this balance between competitivism and welfareism. It's a great question and it is political um, in nature. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I would start, you know, Sasson and talking about the roots of how cities have gained their capacity and gained their, their economic power has been around this sort of agglomeration effect. And so I would say that the in global engagement of cities is, is tied deeply to that agglomeration effect and the search for capital. Um, and that there is a 
reaction that has happened after that. Um, and so historically, I would say places like New York and Tokyo and Berlin, uh, Johannesburg have heavily invested into city staff who are working for their economic development department. Um, and though cities do both, I would say that the, the bureaucrats doing that work have historically been located within economic development. And that, that economic development strategy of luring uh, competing businesses into your city um, has been the job of a very particular group of bureaucrats for economic development purposes. Now, then that swings when there's more uh, socialist or um, very liberal uh, folks that come into office. Um, I think that Barcelona, I gave an example of that when um, the mayor, the governing coalition in Barcelona came um, on board, they're democratic socialists. Um, they, they downsized their economic development department and their economic development department um, no longer went in search of tourism as their primary economic driver. And there was an anti-tourism sort of backlash. And it was about investing into public health campaigns, investing into housing and adequate housing. Um, public housing uh, went up. And I think that Berlin is experiencing a very similar sort of retrenchment back to serving its, its residents rather than uh, global capital. So I would say um, on balance that we have primarily invested into, um, in, in U.S. cities especially that I'm familiar with, most diplomats in U.S. cities that are charged with any global mandate are within their economic development department, and that it is up to politicians, usually elected individuals, like a mayor of Barcelona or a mayor of Paris is a very good example of uh, exporting good urbanism and infill density and that sort of thing. Um, it, it's usually more liberal politicians that engage globally on more welfare centric conversations where there's sort of um, a bureaucratic push towards um, luring in capital. Thank you. Let me just also, folks who came in late, please don't uh, hesitate to, to pop on up and, and grab some food here and join in the conversation. So I'm going to, uh, I have Debbie, Cullen, and Frank. If anybody else has a question, I'll put you on the queue. Maybe um, you could each introduce yourselves as you ask your question. Hi, thanks. I'm Debbie Avant, and I direct the C Center here. Um, and this is great. I mean, it, it's interesting because um, when we were searching for a title of our 2010 book, um, we called it Who Governs the Globe as a nod to Robert Dahl, which is really talking about politics at a very local level in order to talk about democracy. And so I think that you've you've hit on something really important. What I'm interested in, though, is, um, you know, I'm wondering if the data we really need is, um, you know, longitudinal data on what cities have been doing, or perhaps data on, like, the impact of indicators on how we think about success because you know if you sort of think about the sort of growth of economic development as really the motor for connection that that could be tied to how we think about success which is often in growth rates in amount of money coming in and all of those kinds of things and you know it's been really interesting um it's been actually through teaching a course on global business and corporate social responsibility that I've looked more deeply at sort of how we think about economic models and that impact on the role that we think businesses play because businesses don't just bring in money. They things to their, um, you know, their constituents in a sense, you know, they, they, pro and so different kinds of models in a sense might give you a better sense of you know the capacity for really thinking about success in different ways because of course you know the welfare model is not going to work if it's just about city bureaucrats producing affordable housing there also has to be other kinds of things so anyway i just wondered about um this whole issue of the economic model and whether we need um some a uh, way of thinking about economics differently and measures of success differently to sort of get to your success rate. Okay, I'm gonna be very nerdy here and talk about my, my backup slide. I've got a backup slide, of course, um, if that's okay. 
um, on this very question because it is central to the future of the of the conversation. Um, So the real question is, does economic development actually help people? So there's a great book uh, that came out in 2017, um, and a, a new volume came out recently. It's by Richard Schrager. Uh, he's a uh, lawyer at, um, and an economist out of the University of Virginia, and it's called um, Strong City, I believe. Um, uh, city Power is what it's called, City Power. And in this, he makes the argument that all economic development programs in cities do not produce any economic outputs that we would expect. And so they go through, um, do better governance models actually produce better economic output? Um, maybe if you lower the tax rates, maybe you invest in education, maybe if you invest into public safety and, and um, make sure the businesses feel like they can expand safely, maybe the agglomeration effect Maybe it's amenities like having um, uh, a, a good solid financial market and that you can lure people to. Maybe it's local incentives like good parks. Um, maybe it's business improvement districts. Maybe it's a good export economy, right? And so it goes through all of these different economic development strategies that most of our cities are employing in their economic development departments and actually would argue that there is no valiance, there's no indicator that those produce the sort of economic security that they're intended to. And that the attraction of new businesses um, is simply a normative exercise in order to grow a tax base, but that it is not actually growing the economy because it pushes out more than it pulls in. And so his argument is inclusive growth, investing into local mom and pops, local enterprise, rather than importing it in. Um, so I think that we need a whole scale rethinking of our entire economic development strategy. Um, for instance, not to get personally political here, but like San Diego spends like $30 million a year on tax subsidies for businesses to new businesses to come in um, to San Diego. I, the, the Schrager argument would be take that $30 million and invest it in like community programs for at-risk youth in our schools and make sure that they are graduating and getting into higher education pipeline. That's a much better bet for growing your economy. Um, and so I, I do think that we need to rethink whole scale economic development strategies. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it, 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 but what is interesting about it, of course, sorry, is that it's it's not just about rethinking economic growth. It's like the rethinking growth and yeah. and and you know sort of. But I, I do think that to some degree that requires us to have some sense of what that other thing is, you know, and what what does it really mean to have a sort of secure. Um, uh, situation in a city um, if it's not tied essentially to growth. But anyway, super interesting. We, we'll talk more. Oh. Thank you, Debbie. I'm Colin Hendricks. I'm a faculty member. Um, thanks for coming back, Joel. Excellent talk, by the way. Um, just wonderful presentation. You should run for office someday. I think you'd be a very compelling candidate. No, um, I, I was gonna I, I was gonna piggyback on what Nas said about this question about why can't you do both? Because when I think of Barcelona, I think of one of the the world's leading cities of industry. I mean, it's got the third large, it's the headquarters of the third largest bank in Spain. It's got a huge pharmaceutical industry. It's very well integrated into the European Union economy in some ways more so than 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 Madrid in, in, in many respects in terms of its locus of attention being set there. So, you know, can you do both is kind of the, the empirical question there. And then the second question has to do with how we think of answering this question of who cities are for, because it's not clear to me necessarily that we have a good sense of who are we as a city to begin with. Um, so I am a knowledge worker embedded in the knowledge economy who's only lived in Denver for nine years. Is Denver for me? Um, is it for Hillary Mattis or Alvin Camba who moved here last year? Is it for longtime residents um, of the city? Because I wonder how it is that we have a conversation about defining 
who it is that we, by which we mean who we are and therefore how we go about per, um, pursuing sort of our collective interests. What struck me about uh, your presentation is I can see somebody with a very different kind of normative orientation weaponizing, and I don't have to say I could see it happening. We did see it happen in the 2016 election, the 2020 election. This kind of same kind of logic being used to entirely different normative ends by redefining the nature of citizenship and the nature of belonging around this kind of idea of, of uh, essentializing who is a resident and who is not. And so I'm just wondering where in this kind of conversation or this discourse, there's space for thinking about how it is that we define the members of these kind of communities. Because an argument could be made that, you know, Oakland is increasingly peopled with folks who have a very different demographic economic background who prefer a very different suite of public and kind of club goods as outputs from their government, for instance. No, that's spot on. Um, on the do both question, I'll just bracket that and say, I think that we're on autopilot right now and we shouldn't be on autopilot and that we have to have everybody at the table thinking through how we do both because otherwise we're not going to do both. We're just going to be importing capital. It's all about that. And right now that is the status quo in almost every American city. Um, and so I, I would say we need to go to back to the drawing board and put pen to paper as a city with residents and say, what do we want to be in the world? And that, yes, we will do both. We will compete for capital. And here are our other priorities. San Diego is a great example of this. Are we simply going to advocate for a porous border with Mexico because the Chamber of Commerce wants freer trade um, and wants the 300,000 people who cross the border every day to have less of a commute? Or do we want to improve material the lives of border communities? Do we want to stop, you know, criminalizing individuals within those border communities? Do we want to build those border communities to be places of inclusion, right? Those are two separate questions, but may have the same sort of output of a better border experience. We can do both, but right now we're probably not. And we should have that conversation. And that gets us to the question, like, don't be on autopilot. Uh, that gets us to the question about who the city is for. Um, it can be extraordinarily exclusionary. I think that if you look at Jane Jacobs and like urban urbanists, they would say that what's unique about the city as a unit of governance is that what defines somebody as being a stakeholder is just being a resident um, and that residence rather than citizenship or uh, where you're born or what language you speak. Residence is the center inclusionary criteria. Um, and that allows us room to um, say, allows us room for fairly populist, I would say, um, demarcators that I think are important right now in our, in our global economy. For instance, um, Canada has passed a uh, new ordinance in most of its cities that bans foreign investment for the next five years, foreign investment into real estate property. I would argue that places like LA and San Diego uh, could use a dose of that too, because our housing should be for residents and not to house capital from around the world. And so I, I think it's very helpful to have residents as the centerpiece of who belongs full stop, and that at the point where you are excluding any residents from the conversation, um, that's, a, that's a normative bad, and that if we are on autopilot in our global diplomacy, we will exclude residents and privilege perhaps other interests. Thanks, Colin. Uh, just a quick reminder to those of you on Zoom to please use the Q&A function on Zoom if you'd like to ask us a question. We would be happy to receive them. Frank, you are up next. You have to go behind you, Joel. Sorry. It's a little awkward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, Joel. Good to see you. Uh, it's Frank Laird. I'm in the faculty at Corbell and for uh, the moment, the interim senior associate dean. Um, I wanted to ask about um, really sort of your core variable, the notion of the city, and if perhaps it should be a little disaggregated. Um, and particularly talking about the city as the locus of, of the, the material locus of uh, globalization, because it strikes me that um, it, it's too aggregate a notion. 
Um, the effects of globalization, the way it's played out materially, varies so enormously. I mean, between I mean, it's one thing to look at San Diego, Los Angeles, Denver, a different thing to look at Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, uh, Milwaukee, where you see just sort of a complete hollowing out of, and especially if you get into cities that are less than a million people, um, you, you rapidly get to these places that have been decimated by um, globalization, in effect, or at least the perception they've been decimated and, and by what is actually a fairly complicated question, but but where I can tell you globalization isn't very popular. So I wonder if it's useful to think about cities partly on an economic spectrum. A lot of them are just in really bad shape. Um, and maybe to some extent on an ideological spectrum, because I mean, yeah, Barcelona and Glasgow, long traditions of democratic socialism, uh, Omaha much less so. And so there could also be, maybe it's a two by two economic and um, ideological differences. And you're going to have very different goals, very different um, approaches to uh, international engagement among those different kinds of cities. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't say that the variable is the city. The variable is probably the, the um, degree to which a city has had that agglomeration effect, which is only the second out of the two. There are cities that have been hollowed out, right? My, my family is from a little small town in Missouri called Sykeston, Missouri, uh, like some of those that you mentioned, hollowed out. The dispersion of physical production of goods to the global periphery has hollowed out those cities and that globalization is incredibly unpopular there because they haven't had the follow-on effect, right? They've had the first part of globalization, but not the second part. They have not had the agglomeration economies and the resentment that grows from not having the newest yoga studio and the hoity-toity latte place and a knowledge economy and the sort of, of cultural rivalries or animosities that have grown in cities and towns and rural areas around the world, right, mirrors this larger trend towards national authoritarianism and urban social democracy. And I think you can trace those, those two phenomena, dispersion effects and national conservatism and a the amenities that that brings with more liberal voting uh, populations. And you can just trace that with the 2016 population. Um, you look at the density by which cities voted for Clinton or in 2020 voted for Biden, very dense, and that everywhere else, very thin levels of, uh, you know, Trump, Trump voters, because um, not a lot of people live there, et cetera. All that to say, that dispersion creates animosity and it creates a anger about globalization, those globalists that we talk about in the last couple of years from the far right. That's not a US phenomenon. That's a global um, far right phenomenon that is um, seeping, I think, from the political economy into politics and not the other way around. So I would say, um, yes, we should disaggregate a little bit more, but it's the same phenomenon. And all that, uh, I'll just conclude by saying, San Diego or Denver has far more in common because of the global political economy with a Johannesburg or a Rio or a uh, Tokyo than it does Sykeston, Missouri, where my family's from, right? And it is that sort of comparative international political economy that cities allow us to, to have um, these common discussions and see these trends around political engagement, around exclusion, around who is um, participating in our, our politics uh, in different geographic areas. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I think I agree. Hi, I think you graduated like two years before I came in or something. We, yeah, we did an overlap but a couple of years or something. Anyway, Dosh, PhD candidate here. I have a question that follows from everyone's questions because I think like everyone's interested in this, like the broader politics of it, because your talk reminds me a lot of the global governance talk on corporate governance. All national governments are failing, but look at these new, you know, super powerful 
engage you know, business actors that are going to fill the governance gap, and we don't need national governments anymore. Look at these new guys who are really you know, powerful and rich, and they are engaging, and it's going to be great, guys. You know, Those global governance gaps are going to be filled, and a brighter future waits us, right? There was a lot of optimism about stakeholder capitalism, and there still is, which frankly didn't produce any benefits so far, but you know, we are waiting. So like our cities, especially like the way you prone, like cities are new, the new global actors. And it seems like we have lost the battle for national politics or politics at the national level. And we are fighting this, you know, the second stage where oh look, we gave up on global governance at the you know national level, but maybe cities can you know pick up the slack where governments fail, central governments fail, right? We gave up on our national governments to do like climate change actions, not our government, I'm not from here, but you know, same same story all around the world. But, you know, maybe the guy who is closer to me is going to do something for me. Like, is this actually the case? Did we actually lose? Or like, and you know, the follow-up question is like, how are these struggles interrelated? Are to, you know, mayors who do good things on in their cities become more political, powerful actors who run for presidents, et cetera. Like, what is the trajectory of successful governors or like mayors look like? And what are the politics of it? Because especially here in the United States, when I think about city politics or in the politics of the cities, I'm guessing very little of their actual activity is around city to city global, you know, diplomacy. It's domestic national concerns, which are generally very, you know, for most of us aren't cool, like, you know, banning trans kids from school or something, right? Like, to what extent should we be optimistic about like this national and, you know, international interactions of cities? And to what extent should we be optimistic about cities having this prominent goal? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, very good question. And yes, I think it does track with this corporate governance uh, theme, I too have read by Avant. Um, and yes, I, I do think that this borrows a lot from the logic of um, who governs the globe. Um, I also started the talk with a little bit of like a red flag. If we don't put pause on this and think through some of these things, we're going to continue on an autopilot um, that is triumphalist at the moment. It is It is saying that cities are are doing these great things and that we are going to govern the globe and and that may be but that it is there are so many practitioners and scholars right now who are not thinking through um this sort of different schools of thought they're not thinking through how we measure success they're just saying cities have arrived we are going to go do city diplomacy and the city diplomacies emerge but we're not thinking through sort of um the the negatives of this and that's why i wanted to do this talk because um if we aren't careful it becomes a reification of some of the very core problems that cities have i would say that the biggest problem that cities around the world have is this hollowing out of the middle class and the importing in of capital so that there are literal towers empty that are invested with real estate investment trusts that are held empty for speculation while homeless people live on the ground below them, right? And that those real estate investment trusts are transnational in nature. And many times we lure them in to invest into our cities through development vehicles. And so those are choices that we are making right now and that we are gaining capacity and power in our cities through that mechanism, but that the capacity and power isn't translating into benefits for people living homeless on the ground next to those vehicles of capital. And so um, if we just say cities are, are the new cool hotness and we are going around the world and our mayor is in Glasgow today, it, it's insufficient and triumphalist and, and um, deeply anti-democratic, which is why we need more activists at the table. We need to think through through a city development or engagement strategy. Who is the one representing our city and for whom do we do city diplomacy? The only thing that I will push back on is that I think cities are unique units of analysis in the 21st century because they do have more material capacity and more economic capacity through that IPE structure that Sassen gives us than any other units, including corporate transnational actors. They are deeply 
more powerful now than even sometimes their nation states that they are embedded within, which allows them to sometimes transcend the national conversation and engage at the national level, which I think is good at a normative level when you have a, say, socialist mayor going around the world saying, we need to treat refugees with human rights. And their president is going, we don't need to treat them with human rights. Having a strong city with more material capacity, doing that is better than if they weren't. And that is uniquely a position of cities that distinguishes them in this sea of transnational non-state actors. Great, Kevin, you're up next. We've got about uh, 12 minutes. We've got three questions on the docket. So let's just kind of turn some things into things, Kevin. <laughs> Question, not a statement, Kevin. It's nice to see you, Joel. How do you deal with the structural weakness of cities in our federal system. I mean, Wyoming has two senators. Denver does not have, it has two senators, but we share them. <laughs> That's my question. Yeah, and we're not alone. I mean, Germany deals with this. All federal uh, structures really um, are handicapped in this, whereas Singapore is a little bit of a different, different situation. Um, the core argument by Richard Schrager in the City Power book that I mentioned is that cities are disciplined by their states and by their um, federal governments, disciplined to not serve their residents by redistributing wealth. That is the dis like, that's Tabor, that is Prop 13 and 16 in, in California. Um, and that we bind the hands of mayors and city councils through a a federal system that creates laws that prohibit them from doing certain things. Um, you know, mask mandates, great example of that. A governor comes along and says, you cannot have a mask mandate. And a mayor is like, what? I'm, I can't do anything now because I, I, I have to sue my way out of this, right? And so our, our um, hierarchical structure is a real problem and that is stipulated. However, there are ways that we can skip levels, I believe, because we have more capacity at the city level than we did in the 1980s or 1880s. Um, that there's a unique moment in time that we find ourselves because of the supercharge of global capital and the, the observations that Sasson gives us about how globalization is territorialized within cities that gives our mayors, like the mayor of Los Angeles, a different voice and different capacity in a Trump administration to basically say, no, we're going to be a sanctuary city, right? And we have the capacity to tell our police officers to arrest. Uh, so we, we did this in, in San Diego. I helped write a policy. This is the capacity of cities. So um, the Trump administration during the Black Lives Matter movement starts telling DHS officers to go walk into the streets and essentially declares martial law in places like Portland, right? Remember this? They're walking around these goon squads of DHS officers are going around and arresting people without their jurisdiction. They're, they have no jurisdiction in these city streets. And so seeing what happened in Chicago and in Portland, I began working with uh, a, a group of activists and our city council uh, to pass a resolution that had binding language on our city attorney to, to sue any federal officers that step foot off of federal property in that we will sue them and hold them accountable for any actions that they do in civil court. Um, and that mandated that our police force not cooperate. Um, and we passed an ordinance that our police officers would not cooperate with federal officers direction in response to protests happening on our streets. That is real, actual pushing back using our power in a federal system to push up. And I think that that is new and it is something that we should observe as scholars. And it's exciting for me as a practitioner and a politician as well. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, my name is Sheila Atieno Van de Graaf. I'm a first year uh, MA International Development. I come from Kenya. And my question is, um, 
as your presentation presents, uh, as from the presentation, great argument. But I was just wondering in uh, developing economies like Africa and uh, developing cities, will the same argument still apply? Because a lot of um, governors, especially example Kenya, we, um, we move from the national system to the localized um, uh, governance. So whereby every governor was looking out for opportunities to attract economies to our various cities. Will the same argument still hold for develop, developing economies? That's one. And the second, will policy, uh, having policy in place transition the leadership of your argument? Thank you. Policies in place. Should we have policies to govern your argument um, of glo locally? How did you call it? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for the question, Sheila. Um, I think a very good example of this is the Mombasa County governor um, in, in national politics uh, became very well known in um, anti-extremism work and that began working as a essentially a mayor, uh, began working with the Strong Cities Network, one of these international city to city uh, networks. Uh, to learn about what was going on in Belgium. I was at a conference with the, with the um, Kenyan delegation in Antwerp in 2017. And it was really interesting to see um, how Mombasa was really well regarded by Northern cities, um, global North cities uh, for the work that they were doing. And so what that allowed for was that transnational linkage mayor to mayor network allowed for, um, I think, best practices to go the other way from, from the global south to the global north in that particular conference. And I think that that occurs a lot, um, a lot more, and that we should study it more. That being said, um, developing economies are the places where I think this is most interesting. Um, places like Lagos um, are, um, you know, one of the largest cities in the world in the midst of a very fractured national conversation. There is a capacity there for their city to solve many of their um, divisive um, you know, cultural foundations between uh, different groups in a way that their national government can't. And so I think that my hope is that as global cities like Lagos or like Mombasa, um, have more capacity because more people are moving there, they have more economic drivers, that they will take a leadership role in national discourse around things like extremism, counterterrorism, um, healing uh, historic ethnic divides, and that we should begin to expect Global South mayors to play that national role because they have a larger voice than, than ever before. Um, that I guess that does remain to be seen. And should we have uh, things in place? That second part of your question, should we have public policy in place? Yeah, I think that's where we start. We need our cities to have this, this strategic plan moment where we sit down and bring everyone to the table in our city, not just business not, that will be on autopilot, but bring activists and academics and um, every political party to the table to craft a strategic plan for who we are internationally. And that that is something that's really not happening around the world. Um, the people in the room make the decisions. And if it's just Chamber of Commerce folks representing us or the airport representing us, they're gonna make certain decisions that maybe a criminal justice advocate wouldn't. They're gonna impress upon a delegation different things. I think that it, it's not just our delegations going abroad. What delegations are we bringing in? I mean, before I arrived at the city of San Diego, we brought in zero delegations dealing with extremism and hate crimes. While I was there, we worked with our diplomacy council in the State Department, we brought in 22 delegations to work on violent extremism, specifically learning from other cities in Europe around our problem with white extremism in San Diego, where we have a massive um, problem with uh, right-wing extremism, um, bringing in former um, neo-Nazis, for instance, in order to have listening sessions in, in those vulnerable locations. A really important thing that we did in San Diego that was not driven by our chamber, but driven by activists and, uh, you know, people thinking about hate crimes saying, we need to learn from others 
Um, and that, that capacity helped us answer some of those questions um, in a way that I don't think we would have if we didn't have that international linkage. Time for one last question. Hi again. Hello, my name is Oscar Angulo. I'm from Bolivia. I'm not an outsider from the States. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, I was executive director of the city capital of Latin America, from Mexico to Buenos Aires. We've been working a lot with Madrid and Barcelona and Paris and Hidalgo. No, it's Spanish too. <laughs> so uh, one question for international uh, things that we've been talking before. How, how the cities can influence beyond that its own city? What I, I, I mean, uh, you know, Ban Ki-moon said, we don't leave nobody behind. And the mandate was given to the international organizations, World Bank, Inter-American Development, uh, European Commission in Brussels, you know, uh, how the cities now they have the power, use the power. The, the problem is that the cities know, yes, we have the power, but I think they no are, we are not using that power in many cities. Uh, I've been in many meetings in Europe, no? Turkey, Brussels, Madrid, uh, and I, I, uh, you, you know very well that the cities in Europe are very together. No? They, they work together, I, they together as a union influence in Brussels to the decision of the European Union. Here in the States, I don't see many union between cities. No? I guess, uh, I, know, I don't know why, could you explain me that? But uh, beyond that, I would like how the cities in the United States may influence the international organizations that are located in Washington. Watching uh, World Bank, the Inter-American Development, USAID, the bilateral office of the Department of States, they don't have very detailed strategic to work with cities. They are still thinking like state to state, no? we've been talking. Why they don't also try to understand, decodify and uh, train people to understand the view of the city is different than the view of the states. But sadly, this international organization is still thinking like a state. Thank you. Very good questions. Uh, I'm glad that we're ending on this because I think it, it, I'm very optimistic about um, the power that we can flex from our cities. Uh, two things come to mind. First of all is, um, you're right, we're not using our power the way that, that we can, but we're learning. And, you know, this is a nascent and new thing for most cities. So we're going to do better. Um, you're gonna elect people like me so that we uh, we go we go do better things. Yeah. No, um, I think the mayors are learning about not just engaging with each other through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which puts pressure on domestic institutions, but you know, thinking about um, our uh, city of San Diego's place in the world, the gateway to Latin America, the gateway to the Asia Pacific. Um, you know, advocating for in the last administration, I'm not saying where I was on this, uh, but the last administration really lobbied heavily uh, with uh, um, the, the, our partners in NAFTA 2.0, USMACA, as I like to call it, right? Really pushing as a, as a, as a mayor, pushing for USMCA um, because it was a very important part of economic growth strategy for San Diego and worked with um, many of the international trading partners in Mexico and Canada in order to uh, be part of those negotiations. So our mayor was working with the um, U.S. trade representative on crafting what that looks like physically at our own border. And I think that's a very good example of what cities can do to flex internationally. Um, there are networks that cities need to participate in more and mayors need to show up. Uh, I mentioned a few of those networks. Um, those networks um, have issue areas that can then pivot as a regime or as a institution can pivot to lobby particular governing authorities um, on a particular issue. Uh, in San Diego, for example, there is a binational uh, co uh, commission that deals with wastewater runoff in the Tijuana River Valley. It is an international institution. It's binational institution. And we have mayors from all of our regions on both sides of the border advocating 
through institutions, through mayor to mayor partnerships to that international institution. We need more of that. Um, and it, it needs to happen on every issue area. And finally, mayors are used to going to Washington DC and lobbying a, you know, uh, Pete Buttigieg and saying, we need a new bridge. Um, we need to get used to flexing our power and going to the Organization of American States or going to an embassy and saying, hey, your, you know, your folks are important and your policy area, uh, here's what we add to your policy area. Um, we need to go on an international diplomatic tour using our, our mayors the way that they do all the time in Washington, D.C. with domestic institutions. Hey, just to wrap up, to remind students uh, who'd like to stick around and talk with Joel about his really, really interesting career trajectory and sort of advice on folks who are interested in working in uh, municipal urban uh, politics or policy. Uh, thank you so much to the C and Scrivener teams, especially Katie, uh, Gargana, and Shannon. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here, including those of you on Zoom. This was really, Joel, a fantastic, terrifically interesting. And I think I'm just looking, Debbie and I were both furiously taking notes, really, I think, very generative for the work that we're going to be doing uh, on navigating the future of governance. So thank you so much for coming to share your thoughts with us, with us and for helping us think through these important questions. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, <laughs> oh.